If you have your Bible, could you turn with me to Psalm 30? We're going to read together from verse 1. I will exalt you, Lord, for you lifted me out of the depths and did not let my enemies gloat over me. Lord my God, I called to you for help and you healed me. You, Lord, brought me up from the realm of the dead. You spared me from going down to the pit. Sing the praises of the Lord, you, his faithful people. Praise his holy name. For his anger lasts only a moment, but his favor lasts a lifetime. Weeping may stay for the night, but rejoicing comes in the morning. When I felt secure, I said I will never be shaken. Lord, when you favored me, you made my royal mountain stand firm. But when you hid your face, I was dismayed. To you, Lord, I called. To the Lord, I cried for mercy. What is gained if I'm silenced if I go down to the pit? Will the dust praise you? Will it proclaim your faithfulness? Hear, Lord, and be merciful to me. Lord, be my help. You turned my wailing into dancing. You removed my sackcloth and clothed me with joy that my heart may sing your praises and not be silent. Lord, my God, I will praise your name forever. Psalm 30 is a psalm that is written by David. And in these opening verses, David describes the whole reason for his psalm. He outlines the motivation for his writing and the inspiration behind the words that he pens. He exalts God because God exalted him. He pens this song. He lifts up a song of worship because God has himself lifted David. He says, I exalt you because you lifted me. And as always with David, when he writes his Psalms, he takes the experience that he's had in life and the experience that he's had of God and he turns it into an expression of worship and he tells us what he's been through and he tells us where he's been. And in Psalm 30, he tells us that he's in the depths. He tells us that he was in need of help. He tells us even that he was dying. But then God turned things around for him. And that's the focus of the psalm. The psalm is a psalm of turnaround because from start to finish, it describes change. One experience changed to another. One emotion transformed to another. One outcome transitioned to become another outcome. This psalm is a turnaround psalm and the result of the turnaround is joy. The time David is through describing the journey that he has been on, it's clear where the finish line is. It's a place of joy. He's rejoicing, he says. He's dancing. He's clothed with joy. He's so fit to burst with delight that he says his heart can't stay silent. His finish line is exceeding joy. But that wasn't the starting blocks. What is outlined in these verses then is the journey of a soul to rediscover joy. And we get a front row seat on David finding his joy again. You know, as a church, we sit out our stall that this year we're going to explore a year of joy. And that's easy to say, but it's harder to navigate. Trust me, if you want to keep joy, don't announce that you're going to preach on it. It's easier to say than it is to navigate. And for some of us, we're keen to get off the blocks and journey towards joy because joy is our wheelhouse. Joyfulness is part of our character and nature. It's already part of our DNA, so we're like, we're heading for joy. Great, pull up the socks, let's go. Whereas for some of us, the starting blocks aren't quite in the same place because the lap that we've just ran in the race has been far from great. And whilst it is in the rearview mirror, for some of us, this next journey is one that's not so much about embracing joy, but it's about finding our joy again. Maybe we're not quite the extrovert. Maybe we're not quite the effervescent type. Maybe we've been through some stuff that has caused us to misplace our sense of joy or even misplace our willingness to embrace joy. Perhaps even our joy has been stolen by the trials and the tribulations that we've been through. Whatever it is, we are actually in good company with Psalm 30. Because David lost his joy. He misplaced his joy. He was robbed of joy, but he found it again. And perhaps 
the greatest step that you can take today is to give yourself permission to find joy again. Maybe the bravest thing that you can do today is to permit yourself to feel, find, and follow joy. For some, that is the biggest step that we can take, is just to agree to allow ourselves to find joy again. Some of us, we need that resolve, that simple determination to begin to seek that which has been displaced or perhaps even robbed from our lives. It's time for us to allow our souls to journey into joy. And as we call that out, we have to identify something quite important. As David writes this song of worship, he jumps from writing about his present reality in verses one to three. He says, I will exalt you, God. He's speaking in the present tense. He moves from talking about his present reality in verse one to three to talking about his past experiences in verses six to 10. And then he joins both of these up in worship in verses four and five and 11 and 12. And that's where the joy part comes in. And we'll come to those verses and probably land on them next week. And it sounds kind of technical to call that out, but what we see in the overview of the psalm is that David's present reality and his previous struggles all find their place within his expression of worship. And that actually is a really encouraging thought. See, while the psalm speaks about turn around and turn around that results in joy, the journey towards that destination is not one of spiritual glitz and glamour. We can often slip into the Christian rhetoric about finding our joy again and view this as something that we wave our magic Holy Spirit wand over and suddenly joy just reappears within the soul. Actually, that wasn't the case with David. There is no spiritual sophistication or prowess to be seen in David's journey into joy. In fact, it's quite the opposite. And even though in this psalm it is an Instagram-worthy spirituality, The rawness and reality of his journey is exposed as an expression of worship. Folks, we don't need to have our spiritual ducks in a row. We don't need to be flexing our spiritual muscles to bring authentic worship. Thank God that we don't need to slap a smile on our faces, put on a front and pretend that all is well and that the process up until this point has been spiffing and wonderful. We can call out that things were crap. We can call out that the journey totally sucked. We can acknowledge that we're not entirely sure how we're still here, hanging on by our fingernails. We can even acknowledge that we almost gave up entirely. Such brutal honesty and such transparent vulnerability can actually breathe before God and not only breathe, but it can live as worship before Him. This isn't something that we call out in church, but we should. The process is as much worship as the end result. The story and the journey are as much part of the testimony as the conclusion and the finish line. And we need to worship God with our process and not just with our punchline. We've become accustomed to worshiping with our punchlines. He's our way maker. He's the miracle worker. He's the light in the darkness. And we call out all of that stuff and it's almost like once we've come to the experience of that, then let's just let out the punchline as a note of worship. But in actual fact, we don't need to wait to the punchline to begin real authentic worship. We worship him with the process. We don't even need to wait until we've crossed the finish line to say, well, this is the journey that we've been on that's brought me to the punchline. No, we can worship him with the process. David does that in this psalm. He describes his process to us and he's really quite honest about the whole thing. He describes three things that he's been facing. Public humiliation, private suffering, and the possibility of death. And for us to identify with the psalmist and identify with these challenges, we take them and perhaps expand upon them in our thinking and look at them in a different way. And here's what he's been facing. He's been facing challenges in relation to, well, first of all, people. He says, you did not let my enemies gloat over me. He's been struggling with people. (laughs) Ever had that? I'm sure you haven't. He's been struggling with interactions and experiences with people, things that people have been saying, things he thinks people have been saying, or things that he thinks people might be thinking about saying. 
His struggle is real. And it's a real struggle that we can all face, particularly us overthinkers out there. He struggles with opinions and perhaps even the perceived opinions of other people. Now, whether it's his perception that his enemies are gloating over him or whether they have actually been gloating over him, we're not sure. It could even be that God has rescued him from the potential of gloating ever happening. But whatever way we read this, he calls out that he has been rescued from difficulties that he's been facing in relation to other people. And you know, the truth is, sometimes the struggle is with flesh and blood, doesn't it? We spiritualize it, it's not with flesh and blood, but you know what, sometimes it is. Sometimes people are the problem, and I know it's not just me that can identify with that. The second challenge that he faces is in relation to health. He says, I call to you for help, and you healed me. So if healing has come, it would suggest that there's something to be healed from. David has had some personal and private difficulties that he's had to navigate and battle through. He's been in need of help, and the help he received was healing. Now, this suggests that David has faced some things that perhaps others haven't been aware of, things that are personal and specific to him. And our health is one of our most private and personal things that we have. It's funny, isn't it, when you sit in the doctor's surgery and you never go, what are you here for? <laughs> we, never, we never chat about these because it's personal. It's private, particularly when it comes to mental health. Struggles with our health are so personal to us. And struggles with our health are that which only we can truly navigate. Other people can't navigate health problems for us. Only we can. And David has had such a journey, such a journey where he's had to deal with some private, personal stuff that he's had to go through. And we all face those moments where we're going through things in our health, in our bodies, whether they've been diagnosed or not, or whether it's physical, emotional, or mental, we all journey with things that are private and personal to us. The third thing he battles with is the uncontrollable. He says, you brought me up from the realm of the dead. In this statement, David reveals that he has faced the uncontrollable nature of life. Those moments in which life takes you on a roller coaster ride and you aren't really sure how it's going to end or if it will end. The moments in which life gets quite stark and potential outcomes seem a bit grim and the stuff from the blind side saddles up without warning and with absolutely no permission just presents itself on your journey of life. David has navigated such experiences in his own life. He felt like he was going to die. He's got no control over what is happening and without a doubt, those moments are the worst when we face things that we have absolutely no control over at all. Now, when we read this, it, it doesn't seem like David is living his best life. And what David shares with us is that in the midst of all of these things, he, he's found the influence of God. In fact, he speaks to us from the other side of these things. He speaks from the place of turnaround and we read big headlines, big punchlines and as he tells us he's been lifted, he's been healed, he's been spared. And as we follow the journey of his soul, we, we are indeed encouraged. He says, sing praises of the Lord, you his faithful people. Praise his holy name for his anger lasts only a moment but his favor lasts a lifetime. Weeping may stay for the night but rejoicing comes in the morning. Now, you could end that psalm there. That would be a perfect line to finish the psalm on. And you could say that finishing here would present quite a well-rounded psalm if we finish just at the end of verse 5 there. But no, no, David continues. A man like myself doesn't say anything quickly. He continues to bring the stark process that he's faced before God. And he, he brings it into an act of worship. It's not just the punchline that he worships God with. He lays out the process too. And he has this flashback moment. Flashback moment in which he tells us what has brought him to where he was. He says, when I felt secure, I said, I'll never be shaken. Lord, when you favored me, you made my royal mountain stand firm. But when you hid your face, I was dismayed. What makes David's psalm so personable and applicable is that so often he just openly describes how he's feeling. He says it. 
this is how I'm feeling. He actually says it in this psalm. And David describes living in a place of favor to us. God has made his royal mountain stand firm. He's living in blessing. He's living in prosperity. He is living his best life. And he speaks from that place of security. He says, when I felt secure. However, this is a flashback moment. And what he now recognizes is that in hindsight, it's God's favor that has been on his life. The favor that he's experiencing is attached to God. He says, you favored me. You made my mountain stand firm. He recognizes that now in this flashback recounting, but he didn't originally. Because in the height of his success, his confession was, I will never be shaken. His focus is on himself. He fails to recognize the provider of his prosperity and the father of his favor. The confession that he makes here places his focus fully on his own strength and not on God's strength. Do you know what? We must never become cocky with the provision of God. When God entrusts his favor, when he entrusts his blessing upon our lives, we must learn to steward it, to administer it, to live well underneath it. We must learn to call out the source over and over again, respect its origin, honor the giver, because every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of heavenly lights who doesn't change like shifting shadows. Let's be clear. It's not your anointing or my anointing, it's his. Oh, this, I'm stepping into my anointing. No, it's his anointing. And he's released it to us. It's not your blessing or my blessing, it's his. It's not your calling or my calling, it's his. It's not your grace or my grace, thank God. It's his amazing grace that he lavishes upon us time and time again. And I know it just sounds like rhetoric to change a few things in the way that we say it, but it's out of the overflow of the heart that the mouth speaks. So if we can begin to adjust that focus correctly, then we also begin to adjust the focus of the heart correctly. I'm stepping into my calling. I need to function in my anointing. It's not yours. It's not mine. It's come from him. It belongs to him. He's released it to us. We must, must, must learn to steward the blessings of God. And we must do that by placing the spotlight in the right place. We have to place it always on the goodness and the faithfulness of our God. David became cocky. He thought he'd arrived. And here's what happened next. God hid his face and David felt dismayed. There comes a sharp change within the same sentence, doesn't there? When I felt secure, I said, I'll never be shaken. Lord, you favored me. You've made my royal mountain stand firm. But when you hid your face, I was dismayed. He moves from dominance to dismay. And the reason is that God has hid his face. Now, this is David, the man after God's own heart. And this spiritual superstar lives in a season in which prosperity and favor have seemingly evaporated. He's living within an experience where it feels like the heavens are brass and that God is absent. Blessing has turned to barrenness. Refreshing and revival have been replaced with wilderness. Ever had those seasons? When we pray and it feels like they're just bouncing off the ceiling. When everyone around you is having Holy Ghost parties to themselves and you're not sure if you can feel your big toe, let alone the presence of God. You know those moments when in worship the person next to you is having such a wonderful encounter with Jesus and they're jumping up and down and they're dancing and you're thinking, I'd love to take you out of the kneecaps. Everyone else is sensing his presence, seeing him move, hearing his voice, seeing him turn up. And your major win is that you've just turned up yourself this morning. David lives in a season in which barrenness has turned to blessing, refreshing and revival has turned into the wilderness. And it would preach really, really well to say that the reason for this is his own cockiness. They preach really well to say it's because his focus turned to his own strength over God's strength. He failed to recognize the hand of God on his life, so God lifted the hand that was being ignored. And you know what? It wouldn't be wrong to preach that. 
because the psalm kind of says that. But you know what? There are times when the heavens do turn to brass. And there's times in which that happens and the hand of God lifts to humble us and to teach us. But there's times in which the heavens turn to brass and the seasons in which blessing turns to barrenness and refreshing turns to wilderness. And there's actually no real rhyme or reason for it. It's not a big lesson. It's not the favors lifted. It's not humbling. It just is what it is. Sometimes that just happens. And those seasons can really rob us of our joy. It's really easy for joy to get misplaced, even stolen when the spiritual drought kicks in and at the same time things begin to get really tough. And for David, it felt like God had turned his face away, which we can view and interpret almost as though he felt as though God's attention turned from his life. However, there's further meaning that we can apply. In number six, it describes the priestly blessing which says, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. The turning of God's face towards someone is linked to the giving of peace. That would suggest then that the turning of God's face away from someone would be linked to the absence of peace. David tells us here he's living in distressing times. Times that are difficult to navigate through. Times that involve enemies and gloating and illness and hardship. Times that feel like you're hitting the depths of the pit or rock bottom, as some would say. David outlines for us an experience of life when peace is missing. And he describes it as like God turning his face away. Do you know what? Brutal honesty time. There really are times in life when it feels like God turns his face away from us. And I know that there'll be those who'll go up to high do and shout, no, never. There's never a moment when we don't have God's attention and there's never a moment when he's not revealing his love and his influence in our lives. And you know what? Yep, that's true. There's never a moment when we don't have his attention. There is never a moment when he's not revealing his love to us, but there are moments when it just doesn't feel like that. And this psalm that we're reading is, is, is a song, it's poetry, it's metaphorical language. And David is calling out how he feels. And he says, as we do, that there are times when it feels like God turns his face away. And here's the thing that's important for us to grasp in seasons like that. The scripture describes the turning of God's face, but it says nothing about the removal of God himself. It doesn't say, when you left me, I was dismayed. When you moved away from me or distanced yourself from me, I was dismayed. No, it says when you turned your face, the turning of the face does not denote the movement of the entire person. When someone turns their face away, the rest of them still there. The point is, God is present, but what's not present for David is an inner peace. And this is an interesting point for us to land on. There are seasons in life where we have to navigate through hardship as part of the journey of God. Moments that are uncomfortable and painful and sore. Pathways that are uncomfortable to tread but unavoidable at the same time. And God allows such journeys and moments to happen. And there may be times in which we face that which is uncomfortable and we journey through that which dents the peace that we experience or even impacts the peace, the peace that we are carrying. But that never ever means that God is not present ever you see we must build a theology that permits problems and what I mean by that is that all too often our church rhetoric is that we magic problems away on a wing and a prayer or we bind them and command them to leave when in actual fact the scripture is full of problem moments the bible is crammed with narratives that contain journeys through difficulty. In fact, our whole understanding of God, the whole scriptural narrative begins with the idyllic navigating into a problem. And the whole human race has been impacted as a result. 
The journey from Genesis then through to Revelation is of God intervening within circumstances and intervening within situations that without problems and difficulties, we would never understand the power of God and the depths of his character. We must permit problems and difficulties. And what I mean by that is that we mustn't face them with spiritual immaturity that binds them, demonizes them, and magics them away, but rather we've got to learn to navigate through them. We have to view them as rich experiences from which we can learn about the power of God and we can discover the depths of his character. Real joy, lasting joy, joy that takes root in a life and isn't superficial froth on the surface of the soul that disappears as quickly as it fizzled up. True joy is found in navigating through the problems of life and finding more of God in the process. It's found in living through the times when it feels like God's face is turned away and the heavens are brass. And it's found by somehow bringing all of that and letting it breathe before God as an act of worship. The pain, the heart, the heartache, the disappointment, the anger, the frustration, the emptiness, the numbness. Letting those things live before God in worship instead of sweeping them under the rug of pretense and bringing worship that slaps a smile on everything. And at its core is nothing more than lip service and adopted stances. Real joy is found in worshiping him with the process and not just the punchline. It's forged in us when we recognize and acknowledge his presence even when it feels like we don't have his attention. Even when the miracle hasn't come, the healing hasn't occurred, the person has not been nuked by God and the difficulty still resides on the horizon. Joy is found in discovering the depths of his character in difficulty. It's found in pursuing his power even in the problem. Joy is forged in the fires of hardship because joy is found in him. And it's found in who he is. And when we realize that problems and difficulties can't change him and can't change who he is, when we discover that the problems and the difficulties help us to discover him and discover who he is, that's when we find the joy that isn't linked to happiness or happenings because it's the joy that is linked to the immovable and changing God who is always there. Now please hear heart here. I'm not advocating a life of misery. I'm not suggesting that in the service of God we have to actively seek difficulty. And I must bring balance because there are moments in which we do need to bind stuff and we do need to pray stuff out and we do need to command it to go in order to see spiritual influence in our lives. But what I'm suggesting is that maybe today we need a bit of realism in our church cultures. We can never live free from problems this side of eternity. Jesus said, in this world, you will have trouble. As long as you're in this world, there's going to be trouble. So let's build a theology that permits the existence of problems. Let's build a theology that journeys through them and finds God and his joy in the process. David found his joy again. And here's how. His difficulty caused him to turn to God. He says, to you, Lord, I called. To the Lord, I cried for mercy. What is gained if I'm silenced? If I go down to the pit, will the dust praise you? Will it proclaim your faithfulness? Hear, Lord, and be merciful to me. Lord, be my help. David tells us that he feels like his life is ebbing away. He's in the depths. And whether that's literal or figurative, what he's telling us is that he's hit rock bottom. He tries to reason with God there. His rationale is, if he dies, who or what will praise God? Talk about a guy that's really quite self-confident. Will the dust praise him? What good is it if he dies? He should be spared so that there will still be praise rising to heaven. And here's the truth. He can't bargain with God. He doesn't respond to bargaining chips. But what he does respond to is the heart. And at the heart of David's cry is a cry for mercy. Hear, Lord, and be 
merciful. David throws himself on the mercy of God. And God is a God who is mercy full. He delights in displays of mercy, the scripture says. In fact, he delights to display mercy himself. David has come to the end of himself. He's hit rock bottom. He throws himself onto the mercy of God and God lifts him up. You know, there are times in life when we have no choice but to throw ourselves onto the mercy of God. A wise man once prophesied to me and he started the prophecy by saying, Fraser, the way down is the way up. You know, it's when we come to the end of ourselves and throw ourselves on the mercy of God he lifts us up and he establishes us in joy. You might feel that you've hit rock bottom. You might feel that you're careering towards it. Take heart. The way down is the way up. Rock bottom is actually the gateway to joy. And if you throw yourself onto his mercy with a sincere heart, you'll find the influence of God in an instant. David cried, hear, Lord, and be merciful. Lord, be my help. He seeks to find God in his difficulty. He seeks to discover God in his problem, and he asks God for help. Now, remember, we kind of suggested that in the structure of the psalm, these verses are linked to the opening verses. They're kind of a flashback moment that adds details to the opening summary. David asked God for help, and verse 2 echoes this and says, Lord God, I call to you for help, and you healed me. Forgive me for jumping back on the hobby horse, and I realize I've done that quite a lot since I've arrived, but it's interesting that it doesn't say, I took authority over sickness and bound the demon of infirmity, and then you healed me. Or I commanded healing angels, blew my shofar, and activated the healing anointing, and then suddenly it manifests. Focus actually isn't on him. It's on God. And I realize there's times we need to do those stuff, chauffeur stuff has still got a question mark over it. But just in case you want one out your handbag, waiting for the moment. <laughs> the point is he threw himself upon God in all out dependence and surrender. And then healing occurred. And we can't help but notice though that his request wasn't for healing his request was for help. And this transitions us into a ministry moment and we journey towards a conclusion. See, sometimes we think that what we need is help when in actual fact what we need is healing. There are times when the heavens are brass and the wilderness takes the place of blessing and the problems arrive and we turn to heaven for help and what we need is not so much to be helped but to be healed. And I realize that might sound like contradicting the earlier point, but often the problems aren't so much the journey, the unexpected people around us, the injustices. Often the problem isn't the circumstances that we're navigating through, it's the culture that we're carrying with us. We come before God and we look for help and we're looking for the smiting and we're looking for the obstacles being torn down and we're looking for him to make a way where there seems to be no way or for the demonic stronghold to be torn down. And there are times when we come before God looking for help, but what he wants to give us is what we need. It's healing. And that's why at times it can feel as though he's turned his face away from us and we don't see or feel that we have his attention, it's because actually we're looking for him to do one thing, whereas he knows something better. We don't often recognize it. Maybe some of us are asking God to alter the circumstances of life, when in actual fact what needs to change is the culture of our own soul. That's what David goes on to describe. You turn my wailing into dancing. You remove my sackcloth and clothe me with joy that my heart will sing your praises and not be silent. Lord, my God, I'll praise you forever. There's a change in his soul that brings him into joy. A change that comes to the culture of the soul, an alteration to the contents of his soul. Wailing is replaced with dancing, sackcloth with joy, silence with praise. He hit rock bottom. He threw himself on the mercy of God. He asked for help and he got much more than help. He got healed and he found his joy again. 
Perhaps the point that we come to as we wrap this up, the point that we're trying to make this morning and indeed over the last number of weeks, is that there is no quick fix step to lasting joy. Joy is forged in the fires of difficulty. It's not based on happiness or happenings. It's rooted in him and who he is. And it's found when we realize that who he is is not impacted by the difficulty or the hardships that we face. He is never challenged and he is never moved. So each problem and each difficulty actually teaches us more about his character and nature and the depths of his power. And therefore, each problem and difficulty can unlock a new level of joy. Now, I'm not trying to suggest that we have to go through difficulties in order to unlock a level up of joy. This isn't a computer game that we're playing. But the point is, we are not exempt from problems and difficulties. It's not biblical to even suggest that. We have to journey through them. And when we bring the process of that before God, let it breathe. When we bring what we feel and what we're going through into an expression of worship and let it live in his presence. When in the moments that the heavens feel like brass, we choose to pursue him anyway. When we lay hold of him with all that we've got. When we come before him. And we open up our hearts and say God. We throw ourselves in all out dependence and surrender upon you. Come and do whatever it is that you want to do. That's when we begin to find joy that is not based on what happens to us. That's happiness. That's when we find the joy that is rooted in him. Because he is not changed or phased by what we go through. So when we connect with him and find him, when we pursue him, and reach out to him with all that we've got, when we come and we actually lay the soul before him as the starting point and say, come, heal me. That's when joy begins to arise that's when we begin to find our joy again. This morning, maybe you need to allow yourself to find joy again. Permit yourself to feel, find, and follow joy. And I went out on a limb here, but maybe you're here today and you are going through some really difficult stuff. I want to say that's okay. Maybe you've been through in this past season some really unpleasant stuff and you're feeling a bit raw and a bit sore. You can't even feel your big toe, let alone feel the presence of God. I want to say this. That's so totally 100% okay. It's okay. Maybe you're feeling upset, wronged, angry. That's okay. In this place, we will never tell you to magic it away or hide it under the rug of pretense. But instead, we'll invite you. Bring it before him. Let it breathe. Bring it before him. Worship him with your process. Not just with the punchline, but with the process. And you'll find him. And you'll find joy because joy is found in his presence. Rejoice again. Find your joy in him.